you can read some more chapters of your book if you like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here we go, all right. Okay, it's, it's eight o'clock. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, and um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, just a few things before we get started. I'm sure many of you have already attended a talk on Zoom, so you'll be familiar with all the various bits, but obviously this is a live interactive talk and we want as many questions as possible for James really. And in, in the talks that I've done before, they've really made um, the talk uh, really interesting. So. Normally you, you give us loads of interesting questions. So please don't be shy, fire some questions across this evening. Um, and we will be, I'll be monitoring the chat function on Zoom and the Q&A and also live on Facebook as well. So if you're watching on Facebook, um, put some comments down below and I'll be looking at those as well. So I'll be trying to multitask whilst chatting to James, but I'm not very good at that sort of thing. So bear, bear with me especially if we get any tech issues. Uh, so thank you for joining us and welcome. And it's thank a real you. privilege to have James here this evening. It was probably about 12 months ago and I think we were due to have James talk in store actually. And we were looking to sort of get him in, in March and um, obviously that didn't happen. So we've, uh, we've turned to this, which I think will be no less, no less interesting for everyone. So it's great. James doesn't really need any introduction, but I, I will anyway. And um, he's a British adventurer, hiker, award-winning author, and Innovate Ambassador, as you can tell from his T-shirt. And um, he was best known before 2020. I think he was sort of made a name for himself by climbing 1,001 mountains across the UK and Ireland. Um, his book, Mountain Man, which he was just reading earlier, and he's got a few copies behind him, uh, is, is a must read and you, you can also find him writing for TGA, TGO magazine and, and Trail quite regularly. And he's also featured on the Outdoors Fix podcast from January last year. So if you want to listen to him talking about his, his previous job and his life um, before the Wainwrights, then that's, that's a really good listen. So, but tonight we do want to talk to James about his, his climb of the Wainwrights, 214 peaks in, in 14 days, 11 hours, five minutes and 45 seconds 45 seconds is really important i think <laughs> and um he that was the he basically smashed the previous time by by 10 days i think is that right james is it 10 uh, days? yeah there were thereabouts yeah yeah okay and um he essentially was hiking for 13 hours a day so it's pretty grueling so really um james my first question would be why <laughs> um, I asked myself that um, on many occasions during the actual challenge. Um, I think, uh, well, as, it, as everyone did, I um, was living through the kind of um, first lockdown. Um, we had a bit of cabin fever, itchy feet, was kind of living a more indoors lifestyle than I'm used to. And I was kind of really keen to go on a big adventure sometime in... The, the summer when the restrictions were eased, if you recall. And I decided to do the Wainwrights in a single walk. And it's something that I'd always been really intrigued by. I'd seen these ultra runners, people like Steve Birkenshaw and um, uh, Paul Tierney, who've done done these big rounds of the, uh, the Wainwrights, Sabrina Vergi as well. And it always seemed to me like the, the most amazing kind of journey through the Lake District. Uh, I'm not a, a trail runner myself. I can't run marathons or ultra marathons like these guys. Uh, they, they'd be uh, lapping me very easily. But I do love a kind of long distance, long distance hike. And so, um, so and a kind of hardcore, hardcore hiking challenge. So I decided to, to go for it um, last summer. I think basically, do you remember when the weather was just incredible all lockdown? So in Cumbria, we just had the longest run of amazing sunshine that um, I, I've ever known. Uh, and I, I live in Cumbria, um, but I was sort of stuck at home with this amazing weather. And um, sadly, when I started to actually do the challenge, the, uh, the good weather immediately ended and the uh, bad weather arrived. So it was a slightly more 
traumatic experience than I'd hoped, but um, but but so be it. <laughs> Brilliant. And you, so let me get this right. You did it um, self-supported, not unsupported, which mm -hmm. previous people had done it. So you set the fastest known time for doing it self-supported. Yeah, exactly. The previous people have done it. And could you tell us a bit about the difference between the two? Sure, sure. So, um, so say all the runners, um, they do it as a supported challenge. So they have um, support crews that help them along the way. Uh, and that can be in kind of a variety of different different ways. It could be pacers, could be people cooking the meals, um, driving a camper van around that they sleep in people giving them massages, sorting out the logistics, whatever, whatever it is. Um, so those guys have got um, got the kind of overall records, like the like the the kind of under seven days records for completing the Wainwrights as a run. Um, but my approach was completely different. So I did a self support challenge, which was where I didn't have a support crew, didn't have any pre arranged help whatsoever. And I was just taking on this challenge myself, just me versus the mountains, wild camping every night, um, and also resupplying via these stash boxes of food that I'd left around the Lake District to pick up um, as I went around. Um, that's the kind of main difference between self-supported and unsupported. So unsupported means you carry everything you need on your back from the very beginning. Um, so you would have to have all your food in your backpack from day one, which I didn't do. I had about two days worth of supplies each uh, kind of at any one time in my backpack and then was just picking up these these boxes of supplies as I as I went around. So um, that was the definition of self-supported based on the, the the FKT website. The fastest known time website has kind of very detailed definitions of uh supported self-supported and unsupported so it all gets a little bit technical and a little bit geeky but um but uh basically i just went for the self-supported record because i i a wasn't fast enough to get the supported record and b no one's been stupid enough to really try and do it uh uh self-supported very quickly before so that was my that was why i went for it <laughs> makes sense makes sense brilliant and um You've spoken before about uh, the sort of dizzying highs and crushing lows, uh, 50 mile per hour winds. Um, these these pictures don't really tell the story, do they? These are the sort of Instagrammable shots that you take, isn't it? Yeah, but, uh, I'm these guessing... were all from the uh, five minutes when the sun came out as opposed <laughs> to the uh, the 14 days where it was raining. <laughs> but it, after, after sort of because it was five months ago, wasn't it? It was last September when you, August, September when you did it. So looking back now, do you look a bit through rose tinted spectacles and think, wow, that was, that was great. Or do you still feel a bit of the pain and, and, and sort of think, hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I feel a little bit of the pain still. Um, it was certainly as soon as I finished it, I was really, um, quite broken by it a little bit. It would have been way more, kind of grueling and challenging certainly mentally than I'd than I'd perhaps anticipated um it is true though over time you do uh, begin to kind of forget the hardships and remember the the good moments more and obviously we've been in another lockdown recently and I have been sort of romanticizing this uh this uh, fortnight that I was able to wander around the Lake District uh uh, every day uh so you so the rose tinted glasses do kick in quite quite quickly um have to try and remind myself of the hardships but um but there were there were there were great times as well it was it was just a real roller coaster and and really it was all to do with the weather i felt incredibly vulnerable to the weather so because i was sleeping in my tent every night because I was walking long distances every day by myself because I was doing it self-supported. So I couldn't dive into a hostel or a hotel or just go home if I felt like it. Just felt this kind of real vulnerability to the to the weather. And so when the weather gods were kind to me, I was the happiest man on earth and having a really amazing time and 
wild camping with amazing scenery and feeling this sense of escapism and tranquility and the beauty of the Lake District uh, kind of surrounding me. And then other days I was walking for 13 hours and it didn't stop raining all day. And it was, and I was exhausted and tired and miserable. And after all that walking during the day, then I had to set up a, a soggy tent and sleep in that and try and cook myself some food and all the rest of it. It was quite, got kind of quite miserable in the middle when it rained a lot. Uh, and as you know, the, the Lake District weather can be rather brutal at times. So that certainly kind of uh, t <laughs> tested tested my resolve, but i um, glad I managed to pull through it anyway, because I did feel like throwing in the towel, at least on a few occasions. Proper endurance with the, uh, the weather. Mm. And then, um, one of, the, one of the things I was going to ask was the fact you were doing it solo, was that, you sort of touched on it there, was that, um, did you find that liberating or was it limiting at times? I mean, it sounds, it sounds a mixture of the two really, but. Yeah, it really is a mixture of the two. It's a double-edged sword. There's times where that sense of kind of tranquility and escapism is, is more enhanced and, more amazing really when you're alone because you're you're kind of um I, I don't know it just amplifies that feeling and also there's something wonderful about just relying just on yourself and going through tough times and pulling through that gives you kind of a real sense of accomplishment and sense of uh achievement and all the rest of it but at the same time if you're really struggling if you're down in the dumps, if you're feeling negative, then you, you don't have a kind of friendly face to perk you up. You don't have a teammate like the trail runners to kind of tell you a joke and perk you up or give you a bit of a motivation or give you a kick up the backside if you need to kind of pull yourself together. So that was, that was kind of quite, quite challenging. And uh, yeah, so it was a real, real double-edged sword. Thank you. Uh, just just zip into a few questions actually because they're just relevant to some of the things that you've been saying from people. Mm -hmm. uh, one question from Jackie was, you were talking about storing of your food parcels and um, oh yes, did you find any of those missing when you came back to them? Um, I didn't know, so mm -hmm. I I didn't kind of leave them just sort of randomly in on a path or halfway up a mountain. I'd kind of um, place them in kind of strategic place them strategically around the the lake district so they were in places like the wood store of a yha that i was walking past um i asked like some random households whether i could leave a, a plastic box of food in their garage or their barn in uh, just below hallin fell i had a box behind a pew in a church uh, like that's always open had one behind a pub so they were kind of a bit strategically placed and I didn't have any any issues with them going missing uh the one behind the pub uh in uh near uh near Ambleside that that was actually in a different place than I'd left left it so when I got there had this kind of sudden like five minute panic to try and find this box uh of food and couldn't find it and I thought this might mark the end of my uh, kind of uh, uh, adventure, but um, luckily I found it and someone had moved it to like a different little outhouse, but I did did find it. And each box, actually getting to each box was really quite a wonderful moment. It was, it was kind of, uh, yeah, just this like massive box of treats basically. And obviously I was very hungry walking around these Wainwrights all day, every day. So, uh, every now and then I got to one of these boxes and just gorged myself on the the um, treats and food that I had in there. I can remember one occasion where I ate, I think it was like four double-decker chocolates, just, just one after the other as I picked up this box. So certainly that's one benefit of doing a good challenge is uh, being able to eat whatever you want. That's quite quite pleasurable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Like Christmas every, every few days, I guess. Yeah, basically, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I wanted to talk just a bit about sort of planning, you know, you touched on it there, but um, mm -hmm. 
in terms of route planning and logistics, and a few people have asked about this, how, um, you know, where, where do you start with something like this? It's obviously, it's, it's a massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've got, I've got actually the route that you did on, on mm -hmm. one of the slides here. This is your route. So maybe you could just talk, talk us about how you came up with this route, perhaps. Yeah. Um, well, uh, it was it was easier than you might think because I didn't um, come up with this route. It's this route was created by Steve Birkinshaw, uh, the guy uh, just there who came to see me uh, when I was just coming over Blencathra. So um, you can tell by my face. Look at my eyes. I was so tired by that point. I was uh, <laughs> half asleep, I think. But um, but yeah, Steve, who broke the record. Uh, I think it was back in 2014, uh, he meticulously planned this route, which is meant to be the fastest and most efficient way of completing the Wainwrights. And he very kindly provided me with the GPX. And I think it's on his website as well. So it's kind of a publicly available route. And all the other runners and, and people that have taken on this challenge have followed uh, almost exactly this route. Uh, that he created so it's a very clever route very kind of intricate and complex and weaves in and out um, but it it is uh it is a very efficient way to do the wainwrights in a single round and i did when i was planning it i was looking for places where i thought i would be able to shave off time or make it easier for myself but each time you kind of solved one problem you created another one if you try and grab one peak at an earlier location uh, an earlier time it just creates a sort of issue further down the line and and steve really did create a, a phenomenal route and so so yeah i was able to kind of follow this and what i did was just use this route and then look what i thought would be a a, a kind of feasible distance to travel each day and then figure out where approximately i would be camping and figure out then where I needed to place these boxes around the Lake District. So just very, kind of approximately, I knew that I would have two days food and I would walk 50, no, say 60, 70, 80 kilometers in those two days. And I would get to that box at that point and then I'd be able to resupply my backpack and carry on. So I'd kind of planned it all out, planned it all out in that way. And, uh, but yeah, big thanks to Steve for doing all the 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 legwork, creating this this kind of a uh, intricate intricate route. Wow, yeah, that's that's quite some planning. And again, we we've we've sort of touched on um, touched on the, the food boxes, which quite a few people are commenting about those. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of planning, what you eat and how much you take with you on any single day. I mean that that's pretty, you know must be quite quite something as well you know you, you obviously got to get enough calories in so maybe just talk us about talk us through you kind of um is this a, this is a daily meal is it yeah so um let me see is that uh, yeah that looks approximately a daily daily meal i i mean i didn't get it exactly right i don't think i i kind of made these estimates before i was uh going on the challenge and i um, and didn't always get it exactly right. I What I tried to do was think when I go on, say, a normal just overnight wild camp, uh, like a one day, one night wild camp, what do I take with me? And I'll have like a coffee in the morning and a, a porridge and maybe some dried fruit for breakfast. Then like what would I have for lunch and what would I have for dinner? And and kind of then just multiplied that out, out over the, the length of my whole journey. So there was kind of some logic to my planning. Um, I didn't uh, speak to or get any advice from a qualified nutritionist, which perhaps I probably probably should have done. Um, but but yeah, I kind of uh, yeah, I just tried my very best to kind of predict what I wanted to eat, and uh, yeah, so I just planned it out each meal, and then just had that ready for each day. So a breakfast was a coffee and a porridge. I was always having crackers with either peanut butter or nutella or something like that for lunch and then loads of dried fruit loads of um kind of trail mixes like uh raisins and nuts and then of course loads of chocolates and sweets uh and then for dinner i was eating 
these these kind of like expedition meals, uh, different different kind of expedition meals, just boiling them up in the evening. So that was my plan. The main mistake I made, I think, was I I actually carried too much food. I just ended up not eating everything that I carried, which was a bit strange. I think I for some reason sort of lost my slightly lost my appetite somewhere along the along the way and. Uh, I did lose a bit of weight. I lost like five kilograms over the course of the journey. So clearly was kind of burning more calories than, than I was taking in. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I, so I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm kind of exactly an expert on, on how to plan it, but, but I just tried to be quite methodical. Think what I would have for breakfast, what I'd have for a morning snack, what I'd have for lunch, what I'd have for an afternoon snack, what I'd have for dinner, and then multiply that across across the days um i also yeah tried to keep it healthy with having lots of dried fruit and uh and what i craved was fresh fruit and more variety one mistake i'd made is that each day i was having quite similar things and at, at, over time just quite quickly i was really craving like fresh fruit or fresh food and I was craving kind of variety so I should have kind of mixed it up a lot more I think um one thing that did help is that I did have quite a few kind of energy specific bars like protein bars or energy bars and I, I love these little things as well they're called Lucho Delitos Columbia energy blocks it's this like mix of sugar and fruit um in a block um and i don't really like the the kind of energy gels that runners have i don't really like that kind of sickly uh taste um but i was using these these kind of like fruity energy blocks from these guys and that that was kind of quite nice um but my favorite thing overall was just being able to eat uh nutella out of the jar so that was the best thing about the adventure it was an excuse to uh, yeah, eat that. So yeah, what, kind exactly. of, <laughs> what, what was your aim then to, to eat sort of 4,000 calories or something like that a day or was it something like that? Yeah, was something it? like that. Um, I, I kind of judged it more by eye rather than rather than the calories. But, but I mean, I know some people that do like really long through hikes don't necessarily take a take a stove or, or, or kind of cook hot meals. But by going for these these kind of expedition meals, these dehydrated or freeze dried meals, that gave me kind of a really good hot, hearty meal every evening, which I did really kind of benefit from and enjoy. And these are really great for kind of having quite good calories and um, and and yeah, I, I really enjoyed doing that. And I I don't if I did it again. I don't think I would ditch the stove. That was definitely a definitely a kind of positive, like a hot drink and a hot hot meal every night. Really, kind of boosted boosted my morale. And as I say, with the food, maybe I could have been more scientific or technical about it. But actually, for me, it was more about morale, more about kind of like eating things that I enjoyed and made me feel happy and gave me some sort of pleasures in life and and it was a big motivation motivation it was kind of uh if you're struggling it was nice to think oh if i get to this summit i can eat some some uh, jelly babies or i can eat some m m peanuts or with some dairy milk or whatever nice treats i had in my backpack so so yeah i'd just say food is a good motivator when you're in the mountains that's for sure <laughs> it's definitely surprising how nice those dry meals can taste when you're on the side of a hillside yeah you? <laughs> they, um yeah hunger makes them taste incredibly good for sure it um, does, yeah. <laughs> i've sometimes eaten them at home and they never taste as good as when you're tired on top of a mountain so <laughs> me too um continuing with the the theme of of gear and what you took and a few people have been asking around this you just talk us through obviously you were when you were packing for this trip, you were trying to save as many grams as possible, move mm -hmm. as quickly and lightly as possible, I guess. Mm -hmm. So what what's here? Obviously, I can see what's here, but I mean, just talk us through maybe what what you sort of take here. Yeah. Um, so my main goal was trying to keep my base weight 
as light as possible. Um, and so I wanted to have a camping setup that wasn't going to weigh me down and slow me down. And uh, so I went kind of as minimalist as I could. I think I had my um, base weight down to about six kilograms or slightly over six kilograms, then the food and, and water on top of that. Could have maybe tweaked it and got it a little bit lighter in hindsight, um, but but I, I think I did pretty well. Um, so I started with the tent, which was the, the Nordisk uh, Telemark ULW1, um, which is, uh, it says on here, 770 grams. So it's kind of like a, um, a, a two skin tent, pretty, pretty bomb proof and decent amount of space, but still only weighing 770 grams. So, I mean, I know that I could have gone lighter, say if I'd bivvied only or um, taken a tarp or something like that. The weather was so bad that I was super grateful to have an actual proper proper tent. So, so that was kind of really great. And then kind of alongside that, I just had uh, an ultralight sleeping mat. I've got the Neo Air Uber light there, which you would blow up. That's I think one of the lightest sleeping bags you can get. Um, it's quite thick, really. It's really quite still quite comfortable, and uh, but but weighs not much at all. And then as a sleeping bag, I actually use this, which is a uh, is a sleeping quilt. So it's not. Um, it it kind of has an open design. So there's a foot box that you can rest your feet in, but it doesn't fully enclose around you like a like a traditional sleeping bag it's a little bit more like a like a duvet you kind of um kind of wrap it around yourself um and that saves a lot of weight so this is kind of really quite pretty warm and warm enough for what i needed um but but super light so all my kind of choices were just really trying to kind of shave grams off and, and get my my kit set up as light as possible um and I know everyone's got good ideas and I'm not saying that I had it kind of down to an absolute T. One of the, the kind of frustrating things is you have to either, you have to kind of, uh, it gets way, way, way more expensive the lighter you're trying to kind of get things, but which is always a challenge and a bit of a balancing act. But um, but I think I did pretty well. Um, my, my kind of cooking setup was super light as well. So I've got this tiny little... Uh, stove i don't know whether everyone can see that just a little canister top stove um and then like a super lightweight little titanium pot so all i was doing was really boiling up boiling up water and adding it to these expedition meals or or making a, a coffee so my my kind of cooking system was super lightweight and then the other way i saved loads of weight was i just didn't carry any spare clothes i just had what i was really what I was hiking in, which was um, my uh, like shorts, um, socks, uh, lightweight t-shirt, lightweight kind of mid layer. Then I had kind of waterproof trousers, synthetic insulated top and a, and a waterproof jacket, but I just didn't carry like multiple spares of underwear or socks or spare t-shirts. I just didn't do that. Um, and that that kept the weight down, weight down loads. Um, and and luckily because I was resupplying by these stash boxes, I did put like a spare t-shirt and a spare pair of socks in those and picked those up every every like three or four days or something. So that was kind of uh, that made it a little bit more possible. But but yeah, it just just kept it kind of absolute as minimalist as I could to kind of keep keep the weight down. It's always this tricky balancing act between like comfort and weight. So you can you can kind of go super, super lightweight, but you might be compromising your comfort or how well you'll sleep or how well you'll keep yourself dry. So I was always trying to kind of balance that, balance that out and wanted to be able to sleep well and enjoy the camping while also kind of not having a really heavy backpack that was going to slow me down. So so those were pretty much my my kind of challenges and, and goals and um because what what footwear did you use did you get blisters or anything like that because changing your socks is so important to avoid yeah that, isn't it? um so i use these shoes these are uh, a lovely brand new pair that are uh 
I think one of the new colors that have just come out is the uh, Innovate Rocklight G345s. Um, so, yeah, I did the whole challenge in these and my style is to go kind of really fast and light. So obviously, as I was saying, I was keeping my backpack really light, but then all of my clothing was kind of as light as possible. And uh, and so, yeah, I like to kind of move fast and light in the mountains. And these these boots are kind of su super for that. They, they're super lightweight. They're like a trainer, really, like a trainer, like comfort. So they were super, super comfy from the very beginning. Um, good waterproofing good bit of kind of an little bit of extra ankle support than just a trainer they've got this graphene grip on the back bottom the uh, on the outsole which innovate is known for which kind of a really good grip so so these kind of served me really really well um and i did the whole challenge in two weeks 530 kilometers if i remember correctly uh all in one pair of shoes the the slightly kind of funny thing with it was that on my very first night of uh of camping on this trip i slept in millican dalton's cave which is on the side of castle crag uh next to derwent water in borrowdale and um, there's two guys in there and they were out kind of bivying for the night and they'd they'd made a fire in the in the cave like like many people do and I'd spent a bit of time earlier that day wading across a, a, a rather deep river um, in Borrowdale. And so, so my, my shoes had been completely drenched because I was in kind of uh, thigh deep waters. And so I put these pair of uh, Innovate shoes next to the fire to try and just kind of vaguely dry them out. Uh, what I thought was a safe distance from the fire um, Lo and behold, I managed to, on the first day of my challenge, melt a uh, massive hole in the in the bottom of these two, two pairs of shoes. So um, I, I kind of that was a very calamitous and idiotic thing to do on uh, on night one of your challenge. I was <laughs> couldn't quite believe I'd been so stupid. Um, luckily, they it didn't damage the the sort of structural integrity of the of the uh of the boots even though i'd literally managed to kind of burn a huge hole into them uh and uh and yeah managed to do the entire challenge with with those shoes so that kind of uh that that worked out well in the end uh but yeah if you're going on an adventure don't don't burn a hole in your your boots or shoes that's if Thanks. if everyone takes away one snippet of advice from me that could be it <laughs> They should they should add that to the uh, the marketing stuff around the shoe. It's fireproof yeah. as well as waterproof. So, yeah, I should yeah. have asked Innovate what their what kind of like uh, fire temperature limits it's uh, suitable yeah. for or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I was going to ask just a few people again have, have sort of asked this question in, in terms of what other stuff did you take with you? You're on your own, music to listen to, books, things like that, or mm. did you just not have any space and literally? Um, so I carried my phone, uh, obviously with, for safety partly, but then, um, but then I had, um, Spotify on my phone and I had like books downloaded on my phone as well. So rather than carrying like multiple separate things, I was trying to do everything digitally through my phone. So yeah, I had books, um, that I was reading, had some Netflix programs downloaded and I had some motivational Spotify playlists and a few podcasts. So I had kind of entertainment in my pocket. I, um, I, yeah, so, so I kind of like to, to kind of not use my phone too much uh, while walking. So I generally kind of like to hike all day and, and kind of escape from my phone and, and get, get away from it all. Um, but um, it was nice every now and then when I was struggling or the rain was really bad to be listening to a podcast or or listening to some music to keep me going. Um, what I did, how I kept my phone charged, I've just seen a few people asking that. Um, so it wasn't too complicated, really. Like, um, obviously, I spent most of the day with it on airplane mode. So that means that the battery is lasting longer to start with. Um, and so I could still use 
my apps for navigating um, and they still use, they still work without access to 3G or 4G um, because everything was downloaded. I could still listen to Spotify without being on 4G because it's all downloaded. Um, I could still read a book because it's still downloaded. And, um, and then I was just charging really just from these, I've got them down here, these, these portable power packs uh, that I'd literally just bought off Amazon. They're not even that expensive, but I think they cost about 20 quid. They're 20,000 mAh. Uh, I think it can charge my phone. I've got a Samsung phone about five or six times uh, fully charged. So, I mean, they're a little bit heavy, and I did carry two of these around um, and then had some spares sort of along the way so I could, could let the power last for longer. But these were great. I could charge my head torch from these. I could charge my tracking device from these and charge my phone. So, so I had two of these and I just had like these, these kind of small lightweight little cables and that enabled me to, to kind of charge my, charge my phone really, really kind of well. And it, and it worked really well for me. So um, that was a good, good strategy really. And, um, and yeah, I kind of like, I know that obviously reading map and compass is really important, but I've always kind of been more at the, the kind of, uh, not sure the right words, but the kind of cutting edge of using modern technology for navigating and just using that on my phone um, was, was kind of really, really great and meant I didn't have to carry loads of maps. And I've kind of, developed a kind of really quite foolproof method for using a phone to to navigate around around the fells without um without having too many difficulties and, and it and it worked really really well for me obviously it's always um vital to have maps for kind of a backup and uh in case you had any kind of malfunctions but for me i literally was just walking hard and fast and um and just glancing at my phone every now and then to check i was uh, walking in the right direction. I wasn't spending hours and hours kind of taking grid references and uh, I mean compass bearings and, and looking at maps and and sort of letting the navigation slow me down. So that kind of worked worked really well for me. And yeah, these power packs are a great option, I'd say. Right, great tip. On in terms of obviously there's a bit the picture there is of you and the the tent and you mm -hmm. you obviously wild camped for most most of the the time. Mm -hmm. um what while while camping i think had a bit of a got a bit bashed last summer because mm -hmm. of the number of people who were going out sort of yeah. while camping and not really respecting the environment what what would you say to or how do we sort of deal with that and, and what would you say to maybe mm -hmm. those people maybe not say to those people but <laughs> how would you go about sort of dealing with the sort of wild camping that's yeah not that yeah respectful, i guess i mean um obviously it hit the kind of press and there was a lot of um, kind of negativity around um, how busy the national parks were and lots of problems with, with wild camping, wild camping last year. And I guess the, the way I saw it was that there's kind of a very big difference between um, kind of responsible wild camping and irresponsible camping. So if you're going with a group of people and camping by the side of a lake rather kind of um, blatantly and making a fire and um, drinking loads and partying and leaving loads of rubbish or whatever, then that is clearly quite um, bad behavior and is reprehensible. And, and no one really that loves the Lake District or loves mountains should or would behave in that way. I would say though that kind of true wild camping is is a very responsible activity and um and it's responsible if you adhere to the kind of well known and and well developed kind of code of conduct really which is all about leaving no trace so that's kind of setting up camp late packing away early and leaving early in the morning um, making sure you leave no litter, not making fires, um, not leaving no kind of impact on the 
um, environment, always camping high above the, the kind of intake wall on open access land, um, performing toilet duties in a responsible manner. All of these kind of things are, are really important. And I think that kind of if you follow those leave no trace rules, that that is kind of is a responsible activity and just about a kind of awareness of how to do that and just um, being kind of competent or just aware of what the rules are and and just uh, and just using common sense really. And so um, my kind of impression was that the the problems were just a kind of minority of people that were um, kind of abusing the the kind of uh, the, the the national parks and behaving in a, a kind of antisocial way. But um, the vast majority of kind of true wild campers would would never dream of kind of behaving in that in that manner. So um, certainly when I was on my trip, I didn't see any like negative behavior certainly high in the fells anyway i didn't barely saw another wild camper i was camping in very kind of remote and off the being track locations and i didn't see anything kind of negative i did see one place where there was a massive family tent low down on some national trust land with a load of um deck chairs out and some rubbish like in a plastic bag hung up in a tree and that kind of walking past that gave me a slightly sort of uneasy feeling it certainly wasn't very subtle subtle camping that's for sure um but but all in all i i got the impression that that um i i didn't notice too much anyway and that i'm sure it's kind of a minority of people in just some honeypot areas that are kind of uh abusing the abusing the the, the kind of beauty of these local areas, I guess. Great, thanks. Thanks, Matt, James. I, how are you for time? Are you okay for another? I'm absolutely fine, yeah. No, <clears> okay, no I just wanted to go over to loads of the questions that have been coming in because we've, we've sure. had quite a few, some of which you've kind of answered but um, already. But um, Jason Ainsley asks, um, he says he thinks what you've done is fantastic. He's attempting the 214 unsupported record. Um, this year, maybe in July, he's, okay. hope, he's hopeful. He's walked most of the major paths in the UK. Um, he's done the GR20. He's a qualified mountain leader. Yeah. So fully understands what, what's ahead. Um, yes. But what, what do you think would be his biggest obstacle to overcome? To um, tricky one. Um, I mean, for me, the biggest challenge was was a mental challenge. Um, so physically, I've kind of never done anything quite this kind of intense and hardcore. But physically, I found that I coped quite well. I kind of adapted to it and my body held up kind of really well. But the thing that I really struggled with was this kind of doubts in my own mind and these the certainly when the weather was just like really, really against me. And I mean, it was it was traumatic weather that I went through for quite a while. Um, that was what I struggled with, that kind of mental battle of knowing that at any point I could just walk down to a valley and call my girlfriend and I could be home in a few hours. And this was really just like annual leave for me. So I wanted to enjoy it as well. I wanted to have fun. So it was kind of a real, the doubts and, uh, and the kind of mental battle was the big, big challenge for me. Um, one of the things as well, I think I would say is that the route's created by Steve Birkinshaw, who's a who's a fell runner. So it's very kind of direct a lot of the the routes and often kind of off piece, like not on paths, just going like straight down the side of one mountain and straight up the other side. And so I found the kind of terrain and the kind of lines of ascent and descent quite quite kind of challenging and I know that's kind of that's a fell runners thing. That's something they love doing, and they're they're kind of experts at that. But as a hiker, that that certainly struck me anyway. That the that the route is quite quite kind of challenging because you're always trying to cut these corners and go for the most direct direct options. So so that's something to kind of uh, be ready for as well, for sure. <laughs> and I guess, I guess you need to be quite cautious as well because sprained ankle. And that's it, isn't it? So it's kind yeah, of. Did, yeah. did you have any injuries 
during um, the... I didn't have any injuries really. Uh, well, I had those sort of some niggles, like a bit of a pain in my right foot for a while. Um, sort of strained it somehow. I'm not sure, but but nothing major really. Um, but like like physically, as I said, I held up pretty pretty kind of well. Um, I hike with poles, so I always got these like lecky poles with me um, that are pretty pretty awesome and pretty bomb proof. So I I kind of think I was helped in that regard. They they kind of help power me uphill and steady me on the downhill as well. So that that definitely kind of helped me avoid any slips or tumbles or uh, twisted ankles. So it's pretty pretty kind of grateful to get through it unscathed unscathed physically massively <laughs> scarred mentally <laughs> um so there's a few people asking what what's next what's your next uh big challenge is it is it a year off and then you're looking to 2022 or are you have you got something in mind um just kind of mulling m mulling things over obviously the last year has been kind of a rather strange one um and uh, yeah, after, certainly after the Wainwrights Challenge, I, I felt like I'd uh, been in a washing machine for um, 14 days and was just really quite battered and bruised and exhausted by the entire experience and slightly uh, slightly kind of felt like the mountains had gone from being uh, your, your saviour to, to your uh, tormentor. Um, so kind of at that point, I was telling myself never to do a big challenge again, uh, but I enough times um, gone by now that I can consider another one. Um, I'm not sure, I'm kind of really intrigued by doing some long distance treks, like A to B treks and uh, and not necessarily kind of super long ones, but maybe, maybe some of the national trails uh, like Cape Wrath Trail or something like that. Definitely would like to do, to do something like that this year going to depend on the the restrictions and the and the and the rules um at heart i'm a peak bagger though so i love ticking boxes and doing lists of mountains and so kind of maybe uh the the strange thing with peak bagging is that the more mountains you climb the more you kind of learn of these other lists of mountains uh that exist and and the the more you do the more you realize that you've yet to to climb so um, I've been looking at the Marilyns in England and Wales, for example, um, and surprisingly, there's loads and loads that I haven't done. So kind of contemplating maybe trying to start ticking those off. And a lot of them are kind of quite smaller and kind of around southern England. So um, that that possibly that I'll, I'll see what watch this space. I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I fancy, but uh, but no kind of concrete plans at the moment. Okay, we'll watch the space. And um, Chris Chris asks, in terms of keeping hydrated, presumably you, you sort of filled up on streams and things like that. Mm -hmm. And did you use kind of water filter and things like that, or, or yeah. tablets or? Uh, yeah, so I just had, um, what did I carry? I think I had two, um, platypus kind of super lightweight two litre water bottles that I carried around and I um and yeah I just filled up in streams and I used a uh what is it now a um yeah like a water filter um to to kind of um filter the water uh the name of it is uh, escaping me for some reason at the moment um and I, yeah, so I just filtered the water as I went. I mean, for many years, I actually just drank water straight out of the streams in the Lake District and um, never had any problems. And there's kind of lots of occasions on this challenge that I wanted to wanted to do that. Um, but when I was doing a peak bagging challenge in Ireland it, back in 2018, I was just drinking water out of the streams and uh, and I'd done it for years without any problems, but I got seriously ill for about a week in Ireland from obviously drank some infected water or some dodgy water and so ever since then I've always always filtered it um I've remember now I just had one of the little life straws um that um you kind of suck into and, and kind of filter water as you drink it so um that's what I used as I went along and that was pretty 
pretty kind of a simple and straightforward approach. I wasn't, uh, so I was just kind of drinking as I was going around and, and, uh, and just kept it quite straightforward, but the Lake District's quite wet. So there's a, an absolute plethora of streams. Uh, it, it wasn't difficult for me to, uh, to find water. Um, so, so that, that worked really well. Brilliant. Uh, Chris asks, could we repeat the podcast mentioned at the start? Yeah, it was Outdoors Fix podcast. And um, what was the one thing you wish you'd packed um, that you you didn't? That I wish I'd packed. Um, I wish I'd packed a much bigger variety of food. I did did say that earlier. So I kind of when I was sorting out my food i just went to my local supermarket and just thought oh yes i love those cereal bars right i'll just buy loads of multi-packs of those and i'll have two of those a day and what i forgot to realize was that after about three or four days you're quite sick of that flavor or that type of cereal bar so i should really have had a much much kind of bigger bigger variety um what else would I have wished I could have had? Um, I'm not too sure on that one, actually. Everything was pretty, pretty, pretty good. Um, James, yeah, a few people have asked this, actually. Uh, what was your your favourite um, peak or view or or kind of day, really, and, and why? Mm -hmm. um, so had a few kind of really great days it was all based on the weather like i said before so the naturally the days where there's a really bad storm blowing through and it's howling gales and and horizontal rain kind of flying into your face for 12 hours uh i have no positive memories of those days whatsoever that was more just head down and try and try and kind of uh um get through it the, the, the kind of favorite moments for me were were when I was wild camping and um, and had good weather and, and they were kind of really really the best moments so kind of two spring to mind or, or certainly a few there's one on home fell I so it's just quite a kind of small little fell and had this beautiful view of the Langdale pikes in the distance so they've kind of the classic, jagged profile of mountains on the horizon uh harrison stickle and and um and all the rest of them and the sky was it was a beautiful sunset and the sky was kind of turning all these different shades of pink and salmon and peach and orange and and i was just kind of sipping on a hot chocolate outside my tent uh the mountains looked beautiful and i just had this kind of real sense of escapism and tranquility and just felt like I was really kind of squeezing every last drop out of life which which felt amazing and and those moments as well felt amazing because I'd come through some really bad bad days as well before that so I'd had some really tough weather and really wasn't enjoying it and then kind of have your just reward at the end of it felt felt e even more special so it's kind of difficult to say there are some best views that sort of objectively speaking it is always subjective based on how you're feeling personally and how uh and how you're being treated by the weather so I kind of encourage everyone to kind of find their own special moments or their own special places it can, really can be different for everyone and um and if you do kind of take on a challenge like walking the wainwrights set even just over many years or over a lifetime everyone will have their own kind of bespoke and personal intimate moments in the mountains and those are the kind of most special ones uh and and yeah so so for me on my challenge some of the kind of real classic mountains like being on great gable looking over was water that was rubbish for me i didn't see that view it, it was it was it just wasn't there like Glen Cathra wasn't great for me. Helvellyn wasn't great for me. I didn't get didn't get great weather on those. So some of the kind of classic ones or or the peaks that always get named in the best 
best mountains kind of weren't weren't necessarily the best ones for me it was sometimes the smaller ones or the lesser known ones where I had kind of enjoyable enjoyable kind of special moments so I think that's how it works out for everyone really yeah absolutely and I think that's that's a good place to sort of um start really and I, I, and I apologize to everyone for we haven't got to your your questions and um but I hope I hope you you got loads out of listening to James speak um Thank you so much, James. It's been really, really interesting. No worries at all. Just a um, just before we we sort of switch off, but we have got a couple more talks coming up. We've got one on Monday, key skills for mountain weather forecasting on Monday evening, which um, could be useful based on James's experience. I think uh, you know if you can avoid the rubbish weather, then it's always always helps. And <laughs> yeah. um, and next Thursday we've got a talk um, with Laura Kennington all about endurance and mental resilience so hopefully you can join us for those and um we can keep you entertained during these what hopefully are our final few weeks of lockdown but um remains to be seen yeah that's that, that's really good james and really appreciate you joining us and no worries yeah, we've gone on for nearly an hour so uh yeah it's great thank you very much and, and no thanks worries. to everyone for joining if, us this evening as well if we didn't get around to uh answering everyone's questions if anyone wants to kind of just drop me a message on social media or whatever then i'll try and try and get back to you uh if i can yeah that's great and um this is how you can contact james that's his website um instagram facebook and twitter as well so uh mm -hmm. brilliant well uh yeah and in, in, enjoy spring in uh in cumbria and we'll uh hopefully see you see you in the hill sometimes i will do thank you <laughs> thanks james bye Ha <laughs> ha.